Okay. Welcome everyone. This is the final lecture of ECE 2002 for the summer 2022 semester. It's gone by really fast. Uh, but uh, I guess minor administrative announcements. Thank you to everyone who's filled out the course survey so far. Uh, we have 46 responses, which is a response rate of 38.98%. Uh, the lowest response rate I've ever had is 50%. So if we could bump that up to 50% or, you know, beat my record of two thirds, that'd be even, even better. Um, you know, I, I do enjoy reading through the comments at the end of the year and I will try my best to make sure that any suggestions you have for how to change this course get passed on to whoever's teaching it next summer. No extra credit for the survey. I'm above bribing you. I don't know. Maybe if I get a higher response rate, I might be more generous when assigning the curve in this class. I don't know. Who, who can say? But thank you for everyone who filled out the survey so far. Uh, please, please, please check your grade in Brightspace. If there is anything that's amiss, whether you think you got points off or you shouldn't have had points off, if you have a zero for the first, you know, five homework assignments and you were like, I totally turned this in. Uh, or if, you know, anything just doesn't add up correctly, let me know so that I can get it fixed as soon as possible. Uh, that may not happen uh, today or tomorrow, but, you know, certainly I'll get it fixed before grades are due. Uh, because grades are due, uh, basically, uh, by Monday, I have to work really fast to get everything graded. Uh, if you are graduating this semester or planning to graduate in you know, December of 2022, please let me know so that I can make sure uh, everything gets sorted out quickly in case there needs to be any sort of corrections. <laughs> um, you know, I think that does it for the big things. I'll have some things to say at the end of the class. Um, all right, what questions do we have about the final exam? I recently updated the, uh, the homework review final exam document in the solutions tab of homework in the content of Brightspace. Um, you know, final is eight questions, four from old material plus some new, new concept, you know, parts based off of, uh, you know, uh, low frequency response and high frequency response of amplifiers. And uh, we'll have four questions from the newer material. So lecture sets six, seven, and eight. Um, how hard is the final? I mean, we're shooting for, we're shooting for a mean score of about 125 on this exam. So, you know, the goal is to get the mean above 125. So that would be getting uh, five out of the eight questions correct. Yeah, homework six and seven are not up yet on Brightspace. They're not graded. I've, you know, we have slowly started grading homework six, but like we'll do our best to get uh, that up. Uh, you should be able to access the old PDFs on Brightspace of the assignment documents. Those were grayed out by mistake. Um, as for the solution guides, we'll hope to get homework six solutions up tonight. Homework set seven, I know you want it very badly. Uh, I, I just, you know, we're out of manpower in order to, <laughs> despite this large teaching staff, we're out of manpower to get uh, like, uh, a solution for homework set seven up before tomorrow. We just can't get it done. Yeah. AJ is going to do well, maybe. I do well this year. Um, I mean, the the goal is that everyone should be a little bit less pressed for time, but at the same time, there will still be some more in-depth questions. Uh, if you want my advice, don't do the Butterworth design filter as your first problem. It, it's it's a bit of a time sink, as you'll see today. Exam will open uh, at 
at midnight, uh, you know, midnight in like, I don't know, 14 hours. That's when the exam opens and it closes 48 hours later. You have one Butterworth design problem. It'll be very much guided so that uh, you, 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 there aren't that many choices. There's one design problem. It's the, but it's a Butterworth design problem. So it's like, it's fairly by the book. Are you gonna tell us what problem to start with though? I like the ones where there aren't circuits personally. So like, I like to start with the problem where it's like, here's an LTI system. What is, you know, you know given the transfer function, you know, compute uh, the impulse response, find the Bode plot, so on and so forth. I like saving the circuits for after I get warmed up a little bit. All right. What 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 do we want to see? Do you want do you want lecture style stuff on old content? Do we want to go over some more problems? Uh, I have a method of short circuit time constant problem prepared, uh, passive Butterworth low pass filter design, and active Butterworth low pass filter design prepared. Problems, please. Okay. Do you want to do the method of short circuit time constants? SCTC. I'm going to say SCTC first. So we didn't get to this last time. So here's basically what we're going to have. Quick, who can tell me what, what amplifier configuration this is? Common source, very good. Common source amplifier. Remember, if the signal goes in through the gate and we're taking the output from the drain, that leaves the source in common. So we're going to estimate the lower half power angular frequency omega sub L. We'll treat coupling capacitors and bypass capacitors as though they have a finite capacitance. So CC1, CS, and CC2 are finite. What's the first thing we do? And if you want points, you should always draw an accurate small signal equivalent circuit. Accurate being a key adjective here. I've seen some creative small signal equivalent circuits in my day, especially in this class. And my neighbor upstairs is being really loud. It's moving time. All right. Uh, this time we're going to leave the capacitances in place because they are not infinite. So we'll say, okay, we'll have V sig, R sig, goes through CC1, we leave in place. It's not an infinite capacitance. RG1, you know, gets connected to a DC source. So we connect that DC voltage source becomes a short circuit connected to ground. And then RG2 is grounded. I use the equivalent T model because I don't understand this class's fascination of hybrid pi when both models are nice. What the heck is that sound? Uh, <laughs> sorry, class. I can't control this. Normally, this is a quiet apartment complex. Um, so we'll have the current source here with this current here, 1 over GM, resistance R sub O. And then we'll have whatever's connected in the source terminal. The drain terminal has RD, which is normally connected to VDD, which is replaced with a short circuit to ground. Coupling capacitor CC2 and RL. Uh, yeah, no idea what's going on. I'll, uh, I don't really have a noise suppression technique, so just. We'll deal with this and uh, it'll be very interesting for whoever watches this YouTube video later on. Um, if I can stay on topic. 
So with method of short circuit time constants, we have three capacitors here. We're going to turn off all the independent sources, and we'll turn off Vsig, and we consider each capacitor one at a time, short circuiting the other capacitors. We'll find the equivalent resistance perceived by each capacitor, starting with CC1. So here we notice that okay, there's zero current that flows through here, so this is basically cut off. So we'll see R sig, CC1, and RG, where RG is RG1 parallel RG2. So this sees the two resistances in series. We'll do CS next. It's going to see RS. Uh, we neglect the output capacitance uh, R sub O. I forgot to put that in the instructions. Put, add that to the instructions. We're neglecting early effect resistance little R sub O because it makes things way too complicated. And then we'll have R sub S, and then we'll see 1 over GM. This capacitor is short-circuited. This goes to ground, so this connects to ground. So CS connects. Uh, the CS perceives R sub S in parallel with 1 over GM. And then CC2 perceives RL and RD in series. So defining RC1, RCS, and RC2, method of short circuit time constant says the lower 3 dB frequency is omega L is the sum of each time constant reciprocated. So 1 over CC1, RC1, plus 1 over CS, RCS, plus 1 over CC2, RC2 is omega L. And if you were so desired, I could throw numbers your way, but you would get, you know, a nice low number. You know, you expect numbers that are like below 1,000 radians per second. AJ, why does CC1 not C1 over GM? Because, you know, this is basically an infinite resistance looking in here into the gate of the MOSFET. So this is basically cut off from the rest of the world. It's like these are separate circuits. The equivalent T model just, you know, makes it a little bit uh, more confusing. But yeah, this is still, you know, zero current is drawn into the gate. So nothing goes on here. Let's see if I can come up with a good explanation for why 1 over GM is grounded instead. Um, let's see. We have no V-sig, which means we have no I-sig flowing through 1 over GM. This is an open circuit, so it's definitely cut off from the drain. Um, why doesn't it see R-sig? Why is this grounded? I mean, it stays at the ground potential, but that's hard to explain. I don't have a really good explanation for the second question. One over GM is not infinite. It's gonna be like somewhere in like the hundreds of ohms or therefore, because normally you calculate something and you get you know a decent value for GM. Well, let's see, was it Deepa? No, Jaya had a question. Is it possible to give a variety of what types of questions you focus on studying on? What should be uh, Okay, I, I will tell you this. I'm not one to say don't study things, but at the same time, there's some things you don't need to study. Uh, unless you're set six, the big things you need to know are method of short circuit time constants, open circuit time constants, and the Miller effect, Miller theorem. You know, I went through these, you know, long drawn out examples of like, you know, here's the common drain amplifier at high frequency. Here's what happens to the common source amplifier when R sig is negligible. Those aren't very important to study. What's important is to know the methods and how to use them. So like the ones with all the design steps and like the Miller effect and things like that. Those are important to know. Um, and, you know, I, we went over short circuit time constants, you know, open circuit time constants, equally important to know. Uh, lecture set seven, skip high pass filters. I'm just going to let you know now, there's no high pass filter on the exam. Uh, it's, it's the same process as doing low pass filters, just with more work. Uh, Tianyin asked, how did you get Omega L? Remember it's Omega, not W. 
uh, in short circuit time constants, uh, this is where we need to look at our equation sheet. Exam equation sheet. So here's our final exam equation sheet. We go to the next to last page. And it says method of short circuit time constants. It says omega L is the sum over all the capacitors of one over CK RK. So that basically says, hey, this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the one over the sum of one over each time constant is uh, your approximation for the lower cutoff frequency. Contrast that with the method of open circuit time constants where omega h is one over the sum of your time constants. That's something I was teaching wrong all last year. Whoops. Hopefully that answers your question, Tianyin. <sighs> yep, okay. Oh, we reached our threshold voltage. We haven't done that in a long time. So who wants to see the passive Butterworth low pass filter design? Who wants to see active Butterworth low pass filter design? Quick pull. Both, both. Well, more people want to see active first. We'll do active. So design an active Butterworth low pass filter. So, you know, there's a lot of words here that you got to decipher. So we're going to use the Butterworth process, low pass filter. So that's important to keep in mind. And the active topology with a pass band from omega equals zero to two pi times one times 10 to the third radians per second. In other words, you know, if you divide by two pi, we're saying the pass band goes up to one kilohertz, a stop band that goes from omega s equals two pi times eight times 10 to the third radians per second. In other words, you know, stop band starts at uh, 8,000 hertz uh, and then goes up to infinity. Then we'll have a max equals three decibels, a min equals 40 decibels, and the filter interfaces to a load with RS equals 470 hertz. And I say it's okay if the DC voltage gain is plus or minus one. As you'll see, that becomes important later on. So the first order of business when you're designing a filter is to find the necessary order. First order of business, find the order. Hopefully that pun helps you remember what to do. So we go to our equation sheet and we say, okay, for a low pass filter, this is the equation for the minimum order. It's the log base 10 of 10 to the A min divided by 10 minus one over 10 to the A max divided by 10 minus one, all over twice the log base 10 of omega S over omega P. So we plug in 40 decibels here three decibels there, two pi eight times 10 to the third here, two pi one times 10 to the third here. Your calculator does this, your slide rule doesn't, you get 2.22 for n min. So we're gonna choose n equals three, the smallest natural number that satisfies the inequality. Next, we find the cutoff frequency. This is actually a lot easier than it looks. Because we're told that A max is three decibels, we can just take the cutoff frequency to be, which uh, remember is the half power frequency, is the same as the passband boundary, which is two pi times one times 10 to the third radians per second. This is a simplification that we saw in our notes. Whenever A max is equal to three decibels, we can just take omega C to be omega P. This saves us a step. And hint, it's a nice way for me to say, do this without having to deal with all the possible design choices that come so far. So the smallest natural number is always going to be three. The cutoff frequency should always be two pi times one times 10 to the third. So I don't have to check your erroneous designs uh, very far. Uh, now some of you will design things correctly and that will make me very happy. 
um, but it's really hard to give partial credit when you have a design problem. So remember the next thing we do according to the procedure in lecture set seven is we choose the appropriate transfer function for the Butterworth filter. So we look at the Butterworth polynomial table and we get the following. So if we open exam tables, not the index card version, which if you have five by eight index cards, I made a version for that. So we need order three Butterworth filter in standard form, it's s cubed plus 2s squared plus 2s plus 1. Thank you, Butterworth polynomial table. Oh, I did the thing it doesn't like what I do. Preview keeps crashing. There must be a bug in preview. Oh. Come on. Oh, no. Yes, the Butterworth. Butterworth always has one in the numerator. That comes from the definition of the Butterworth polynomials. Uh, or that comes from the definition of Butterworth filter, where it's always k over uh, absolute value of k divided by square root of 1 plus quantity omega divided by omega c quantity to the 2n under the square root. I remember for a normalized filter, k is always equal to 1, and the cutoff frequency omega c is always equal to 1 radian per second. I gave you the table up to Butterworth order 8 for a reason. I won't ask you to design an 8th order Butterworth filter, but you know I might expect you to work with an 8th order Butterworth filter. I mean, I could ask you to get this far, at least, with uh, an eighth order Butterworth filter. I wouldn't ask you to actually, I could ask you to, you know, write out the, the, the draw the circuit, but I can't ask you to find component values. That takes too long because it's a nonlinear equation solve. Okay. One thing, so we get, you know, remember one in the numerator, Butterworth polynomial in the denominator. This one. If it's active, we actually don't want the standard form. So this is a key point. Active Butterworth filter, we actually want the uh, factored form. So we want it factored as a linear term and then a whole bunch of complex quadratic terms or irreducible quadratic terms. So the following step, we figure out what sal and key topology corresponds to a third order filter with a known load. We need one stage to implement uh, the real pole with the inverting voltage control voltage choice amplifier and one stage to implement and uh, the pair of complex poles using the Salen key topology with k equals one. We do not need to worry about finite zeros because there are no finite zeros in this low pass filter. So the first stage is going to implement, you know, h1 of s equals what negative one over s plus one. So the input emittance, you know, remember it's input emittance over uh, the feedback emittance. So the input emittance is just a resistor with R8 equals one ohm. And the feedback emittance is just the parallel combination of a capacitor with CF equals one farad and RF1 equals one ohm, right? Because that's the coefficient of here is the capacitance, the coefficient of here uh, the constant term is the conductance, which is one over the resistance. Second stage is a little trickier. We have to implement one over S squared plus S plus one. So we equate coefficients to the known transfer function it implements. So we'll get this term over S squared plus one over R2 parallel R3 C2 times S plus one over R2 R3 C2 C3 for H2 of S. So, you know, for this to be equal to this, we need R2, R3, C2, C3 to be one second squared. And we need R2 parallel R3, C2 to be equal to one second. 
So we choose values. So we choose R2 equal to one ohm, we choose R3 equal to one ohm. So now we have four equations and four unknowns. This is solvable. Before it was just two equations and two unknowns. We had too many design degrees of freedom. So we, we chose the resistances to make things easier. R2 with parallel R3 is half an ohm. Uh, to be multiplied by C2, we get one second. We need C2 is equal to two farads. And then for C3 to uh, work out uh, in this equation, we need C3 to be half a farad. So we're going to choose a magnitude scaling of 10 to the third to get sensible component values. This is where I would need to give you a KM value to use. Otherwise, you could choose any KM value and I'd have to check your work, and we don't want that. So I would tell you the KM value. I'd say, you know, choose a KM such that the minimum resistance in your circuit is at least, you know, 500 ohms. This, you know, choose a KM such that the smallest resistance in this circuit is one, one kilo ohm. Boom. No more design freedom. Apply a frequency scaling of 2 pi times 1 times 10 to the third to change the cutoff frequency from 1 radians per second in our normalized low-pass filter to this value right here, two pi times one times 10 to the third radians per second. So the overall DC voltage gate of negative one is okay because the design instructions said it was okay, the overall gain was negative one. Notice this is an active filter. So like if we wanted to have K be equal to 2000, it might be a little bit large, but we could do it. If we wanted to have, you know, it be equal to 100 or negative 100, that'd be pretty easy to do. We just had to modify these component values again. And that would happen in this stage right here. And then, you know, we, you know, we, we can use the sound key topology with K not equal to one if we had to. Applying the magnitude and frequency scaling, we get these values. So one kilo ohm for all the resistances, 159 nanofarads for CF1, Half that for C3, twice that for C2. And that is okay to feed a load of 470 ohms because of the active implementation. These are ideal op amps. I got them on eBay. No freedom. Nope, I don't want any freedom in design problems. It's too hard to grade. I'm trying to get these things graded as fast as possible. You're only softwares. You're not ready for the full design freedom of being an engineer. Except after today, you will be. <laughs> AJ remembers the exact question number, but yes, that is correct. I learned from homework one question three. Someone has an eidetic memory. Any questions about the active Butterworth filter? Do you want to see the passive one now? Okay. <laughs> passive Butterworth flow pass filter. That meets the brick wall specifications in the diagram above. The filter interfaces to a load of RL equals 100 ohms. So we get the A max is equal to three decibels, A min is equal to 60 decibels, and the lower or the upper bound of the pass band is 10 radians per second, and the lower bound of the stop band is 300 radians per second. Find the necessary order of the filter, always our first order of business. You plug in the numbers, chug, chug, chug. You get Edmit is greater than or equal to 2.03 radians, or 2.03. Darn, that's just slightly more than two. So we're going to have to use a third order uh, filter now. So we're going to find the cutoff frequency. So because the, again, A max is equal to three decibels, we take omega C to be omega P is equal to 10 radians per second. No, it's like I'm signaling to you that I'm not going to ask you to find, you know, the bounds of the, of the cutoff frequency and choose the value. Again, that's design freedom. I don't want that on the exam. So 
you're pretty sure to see a max equals to three decibels if it's a low pass filter and you're not going to see high pass filters so that's a good hint about what's coming your way hmm. so this is where we go to the butterworth polynomial table so we uh Asked preview very nicely to open the exam tables. And when we do that, we say, okay, what's the third order Butterworth polynomial? S cubed plus 2s squared plus 2s plus 1. Hey, we don't need to deal with any of these messy ones right now. It's like they're, we're saving them up for the exam so that there's something for us to quiz you on. Uh, or maybe we'll do a lower order one like second order filter. Hmm. Or maybe we'll show you exactly what we did here, but like, you never know. I could be wily like that. But for now, we need this third order equation. So thank you, preview, close nicely, open this back up, and it works fine. So remember, numerator is one for our normalized filter. We always design the normalized filter first. There we go. We need to figure out what Cower topology corresponds to the third order filter with a known load. So remember, passive Butterworth, Cower topology. So we're going to ha we're not going to have a known source resistance. We're going to have a known load resistance. So we're going to have a voltage source, and uh, because we don't have any source resistance, we need to have a series element after the ideal voltage source, then a shunt element. And then finally, a series element again before the load. Thus, we need a T model that alternates inductor to capacitor to inductor. So just without needing any special you know, memorization of what's in the lecture, we know what exactly we're going to need. Series inductor, shunt capacitor, series inductor. Why specifically inductor capacitor inductor? Because we want a low pass filter. So what happens if we plug in zero frequency, these inductors behave like short circuits, capacitors open, everything goes through from the uh, source to the load. What happens if we go to infinite frequency, open, short, open, so it doesn't want to go through, would be shorted anyway, then doesn't want to go through, Hard, nothing gets through at infinite frequency. Hmm. Hopefully we are good on that, so we can figure out right away we need this T model with the uh, load resistance. So because we're dealing with a Cower topology where all of our poles kind of mix around with each other, we want the standard form of the transfer function, not the factored form. So how are we going to get the, how are we going to match coefficients? Well, if you don't know, have values memorized, you have to do KCL uh, in this case, because, you know, there's just too many nodes here. We have this is an unknown node and VR is an unknown node. So we're going to first write for VC of S. So we'll get VN of S minus VC of S over SL1, the uh, S domain impedance of L1, working the S domain, not the J omega phase of domain, minus SC VC of S, and then plus VR of S minus VC of S over SL2 equals zero. We'll also write uh, uh, an equation for this node above the resistor. VC of S minus VR of S over SL2 minus VR of S over RL equals zero. Hmm. We can solve that for VC of S. We get VC of S equals VR of S times quantity one plus SL2 over RL. Fast algebra. So we solve this equation. So we get everything with VC of S on the other side of this equation. So we get VN of S over SL1 plus VR of S over SL2 equals VC of S times quantity one over SL1 plus SC plus one over SL2. Well, we know what VC of S is now from our other KCL equation we solved. So we get, you know, same left-hand side, VR of S times one over SL2 over RL times the same 1 over SL1 plus SC plus 1 over SL2. Now we get VN on one side, VN of S over SL1, VR of S on the other. 
uh, we move this term to the other side after we uh, distribute out, you know, FOIL out this, you know, binomial and trinomial, one over SL1 plus SC plus one over SL2 plus L2 over RL L1 plus S squared L2 C over RL plus one over RL minus one over SL2. That one over SL2 cancels out. And uh, we move the SL1 to the other side, uh, VR to the other. So flip flop, swip swap, we get uh, VR of S over VN of S is equal to one over all of this SL1, uh, this nonsense right here. We multiply it out, we get H of S is equal to one over uh, one plus one over RL, L1 plus L2S plus uh, L1C S squared plus L1 L2 C over RL S cubed. But you know, we don't like leading terms uh, here because that doesn't match our leading term of one in front of S cubed. So we divide through by this and we get H of S is equal to RL over L1 L2 C over S cubed plus RL over L2 S squared plus one over C, uh, basically L1 parallel L2 times S and then plus RL over L1 L2 C. All algebra, all the time, doing good old EC 20,001 circuit style stuff. Equate the coefficients of the transfer function just derived to that uh, of the Butterworth polynomial. And we'll find the circuit elements in the normalized low pass filter. So we'll get that this term has to be equal to one second cubed. Uh, this term is equal to two times one over second. Uh, L2 over RL is one half of a second. We'll choose RL to be one ohm for our normalized circuit. We'll get L2 is one half a Henry. C is four thirds of a farad. L1 is three halves of a Henry. If you're like, man, this seems like a lot of work to ask to do on exam, even if we have two hours, you are right. So you're seeing a passive Butterworth filter of order of greater than three is unlikely. I would, I would, I would keep that in mind. So magnitude scaling with KM equals 100 to get the load resistance to match the desired load. No design freedom there. And we have KF equal 10 to change the cutoff frequency from one radians per second to 10 radians per second. Work all this out. You get RL is now 100 ohms. L1 is now 5 Henry. L2 is now 15 Henry. And then C is now 1.33 millifarad. And this is your completed circuit for a... a Third order Butterworth passive low pass filter connecting to a load. A zero order circuit is just a resistor divider. I might give you the equation for a topology if you have a higher order circuit. Uh, I probably will make you work it out though, for if it's a second or first order circuit. Notice the active filter is actually somewhat easier uh, because of the active filter, all you just need is the factored form and you just repeat this process for every, uh, you know, the first stage is always like this if it's an odd order filter, and then you just have a whole bunch of these sound key topologies. You just have to remember what the sound key topology looks like. But there you're only matching, you know, two terms and you get to choose two resistances. Yeah, uh, good, good try. If you had, if you had approached me yesterday, there's a chance I could have implemented your suggestions, but the exam has been written now, so it's not really changing. The last thing I had was a lossless transmission line question. Here's a hint. You're not going to see a lossy transmission line on the exam. It'll be lossless or maybe distortionless, but like, or 
you're not going to see a lossy transmission line on the exam. So here's a problem. I didn't have time to get out a solution. I decided to go to bed instead. Sorry, folks, I needed sleep. But it's very similar to like problem eight on your homework that you just did. And it asked about reflection coefficients and such. Draw an appropriate end to end model. So, you know, if lambda is, uh, or excuse me, if L is less than lambda over, you know, 60, uh, you know, you can get Y of a short model. If it's less than lambda over 20, you'll need a medium model. And if it's greater than lambda over 20, you'll need the, the, the long line model. Interesting. If it's a matched load, you get a reflection coefficient of zero. So anytime you have that the load impedance equals the characteristic impedance by our equations, notice right here, the way you get gamma, the reflection coefficient to be equal to zero is whenever ZL equals Z naught. So if you have a matched, you know, termination where your load impedance equals the characteristic impedance of your transmission line, you get a reflection coefficient of zero. How do you get your transmission coefficient to be zero? Well, you get your transmission coefficient to be zero whatever 2ZL is equal to zero, which is in other words saying ZL is equal to zero, which is a short circuit. So if you have a short circuit, you get zero transmission. All right, I had a little bit more time than I expected. Are we all good on MOSFET problems and stuff like that? Does everyone remember MOSFET problems? Someone asked about MOSFET problems know how to find uh, the DC drain current, calculate the small signal parameters, make the small signal model, find gain and short circuit, uh, or excuse me, small signal resistances. Can we go over gain? I don't really have anything prepared. Um, ran out of the time. I don't remember. I don't even remember which homework has it. Uh, if someone can, if someone wants to figure out which homework had a question about gain that you want me to go over, I can go over it. But I'll just go over the lecture set for now. So, say for example, we have this common gate amplifier, and we have V sig feeding R sig into CC one, and then you know RS here in this path, RD here, and then CC two and RL. Easy to explain with a picture than it is with words. The first thing we would do is solve this DC circuit. So basically, you would get whatever uh, you know current flows through here. It would be actually pretty hard to solve. Uh, you know, it's not like we have a current source that says ID must be equal to a certain value. We would actually have to figure it out based off of uh, square law equations. So figuring out what the DC current capital I sub D is would be pretty hard. It would involve a quadratic equation solve. But if you had it, you'd be able to find GM and any R little R sub O. But you know, we're going to ignore a little R sub O in this problem, say lambda is equal to zero, early voltage is equal to infinity, one of those two things. 
So we draw the small signal equivalent circuit. So we'll have V sig, R sig. And then if we're dealing with, you know, infinite capacitances, these become short circuits. If not, they just stay in place. So if this is infinite capacitance, it's a short circuit. And then we'll have RS connecting to a short circuit to ground. And then we'll have our equivalent T model for the transistor. The drain side will have RD connecting to a short circuit to ground, a short circuit for CC2, and then RL to ground, and then our output voltage there. Always remember to label output voltage, input voltage of your source. You must label your current source with dependent current source with its control current or control voltage. So it's either I, where this is I right here, or it's GM, VGS, where VGS is between gate and source. The equivalent T model has one over GM and then this current control current source. And the gate is grounded. What is the uh, gain here? So, okay. What is VO in terms of VI? Uh, and then finally VO in terms of VSIG. So, uh, you would be given your equation sheet, but you would have to be able to interpret it. Uh, because you, you'll never get the exact same circuit configuration as you see here. But okay, we get that uh, the cur the voltage here is basically going to be, um, you know, GM times VI times the equivalent resistance RD parallel RL. Um, and that current also flows down through this resistance, one over GM, and through the uh, here, RS. So in order to get VI to VO, you would do all your math, and you would get, OK, it's equal to GM times VI uh, times RD parallel RL. I'm not doing it. Explaining this. Then, in order to get uh, VI in terms of V sig, we look at this input voltage divider where we get Rn uh, over R sig, where Rn is the parallel combination of these two resistances, one over GM and RS. And that gives you uh, VI in terms of V sig. What questions do we have? That made more sense. I'm glad it made more sense. <laughs> Normally, we, we just kind of give you the equation sheet and we would say, OK, you're going to get, you know, the gate is GM times your output resistance, your complete output resistance, so RT parallel with RL. So it's a positive for the common gate amplifier, GM RT parallel RL, but you also have to deal with your input voltage divider. So, you know, uh, RN over RN plus RC. So the question is, why do we want to have uh, RS here rather than uh, just ground the source terminal directly for the common source amplifier? Well, Pranav, the answer has to do with uh, establishing the DC bias point. We want the four resistor DC biasing network because it's a lot more stable. So the problem is, is if you don't have RS uh, at all when you're a DC biasing network, you're very sensitive to the small disturbances in your power supply, and you can end up with vastly different drain currents than if you had an RS here. So for negative feedback reasons in the DC network, you want to have an RS, but for AC reasons, you probably don't want to have RS unless you're dealing with, you know, source degeneration, in which case, you know, you, you apply, you know, some, leave some RS in place. So that's why we, we, we have it. It's there so we establish the DC drain current uh, reliably and stably.
What other questions do we have? No questions? Everyone ready for the exam tomorrow and Thursday? Let's see here. Tomorrow, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, hopefully you see the scores by Monday of next week. But that's going to be, it's going to be very rough on us. Please, 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 you know, upload in the normal time. Do not go past the grace period. If something does go wrong, do shoot me an email. But like, we really can't afford to have a whole bunch of people uh, you know, submitting their exam abnormally. Still 20 minute grace period, yes. Um, you know, yeah. our ability to get things graded on time is contingent on everyone's ability to make, you know, the normal red space instructions work. You know, if you, if you know of any cheating, do let us know. We haven't been that good at catching cheaters this, this semester. Hopefully that means there was very little cheating to catch. If there's more than one load, it's whatever the Thevenin equivalent resistance is. So then, eight questions on the exam, Tianyin. Any questions? Graphical convolution, fair game. Yeah, Aubrey, uh, I guess we used the other one. It, it, it invalidates another equation in the, ho in the lecture set, but like we'll use, we'll use the other equation. I'll, I'll make that clear in the exam. Red, favorite color. Back to the Future, favorite movie. Favorite exam question. Uh, that's a little bit harder. Probably the Butterworth question. I like Butterworth stuff a lot. No, it's not the question you should do first. Favorite class I took, ECE 321, as an undergraduate. All right. <sighs> yeah, four old material questions, four new material questions. What's on the final exam? Uh, well, it's written in black ink. A lot of circuits, some electronics. Yeah. In order, in order, to, in order to pass the class, you must play Minecraft. If you get better than a B. <laughs> 
favorite block in Minecraft. Uh, go to a Mario Kart. Uh, Yoshi usually. I like Yoshi. I also like Mario himself. <laughs> All right. Chess rating has not improved. Still in the five hundreds. <laughs> Terrible. All right. Uh, just for the sake of everyone else's time studying, uh, I'll go ahead and give closing statements. So thank you again. You've been a really good class. I've definitely enjoyed my time. Uh, makes me like teaching a lot when I have a class like this, uh, especially the in-person contingent. You guys have been really awesome. Um, Final advice, you know, if you ever need me for course advice or any type of circuits questions, you know, once a student, always a student, please, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, I will try to get some extra content out in the class. Uh, if you want cool artwork, I recommend the nomograph, the nomograms I posted in the solutions guide of the homework. There's some really cool art. Those are analog calculators. Uh, furthermore, uh, you know, as you move on and progress in your career, remember to keep helping each other. You know, engineering is a very collaborative discipline. So hopefully the people you've worked with along the way in this class, you continue to work with in your future classes. Uh, it'll definitely be better than banging your head against the wall by yourself. Because engineering gets tough, but, you know, better to have, you know, good electrical engineering friends or computer engineering friends to help along the way. And for their friends in other majors, you know, that goes for you as well. Make, make friends, variety of backgrounds as well. Uh, on that note, you know, I recommend you join a student organization too. Uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of IEEE. So if you if you get a chance, you know, join IEEE or any of the other organizations like ECSS or HKN. I am an admiral in ROV, uh, but that doesn't count very much. Uh, I will be holding office hours today at the normal time of 1130 and I'll also be holding it at six o'clock to eight o'clock tonight. So uh, that'll give you a little bit more time to ask questions. I still got to take the final exam and, and see exactly how difficult it is. Um, I think it's away. But yes, go join a student organization. Uh, you know, keep studying, work hard, stay friends with each other. Uh, you've been a good class. Thank you for everything. You're welcome, everyone. I'll, I'll let you go. Otherwise, I'll get teary-eyed. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.